In all that vast and silent world there was, for Phil Acton, only himself, his trouble, and his friend. And so it came about. Little by little, the young man told Patches the story of his dream, and of how it was now shattered and broken. Sometimes bitterly, as though he felt injustice, sometimes harshly, as though in contempt of some weakness of his own, with sentence broken by the pain he strove to subdue, with halting words and long silences, Phil told of his plans to rebuild the home of his boyhood and of restoring the business that, through the generosity of his father, had been lost. Of how, since his childhood almost, he had worked and saved to that end, and of his love for Kitty, which had been the very light of his dreams, and without which, for him, there was no purpose in dreaming. And the man who rode so closely beside him listened with a fuller interest and a deeper sympathy than Phil knew. And now, said Phil hopelessly, it's all over. I've sure come to the end of my string. Reed has put the outfit on the market. He's going to sell out and quit. Uncle Will told me night before last when I came home to see about the shipping. Reed's going to sell? exclaimed Patches, and there was a curious note in his voice which Phil did not hear. Neither did Phil see that his companion was smiling to himself under the cover of darkness. It's that damned Professor Parkhill that's brought it out, continued the cowboy bitterly. Ever since Kitty came home from the east, she's been discontent and dissatisfied with ranch life. I was all right when she went away, but when she came back, she discovered that I was nothing but a cowpuncher. She has been fair, though. She has tried to get back to where she was before she left, and I thought I could win her back again in time. I was so sure of it that it never troubled me. You've seen how it was, and you've learned how she was always wanting the life that she learned to want while she was away, and the life that you came from, Patches. I have been mighty glad for your friendship with her, too, because I thought she would learn from you to a man that could have all that was worth having in that life and still be happy and content here. And she would have learned, I'm sure of it. She couldn't help but see it. But now that damned fool who knows no more of real manhood than I do of his profession has spoiled it all. I don't understand, Phil. What has Park Hill to do with Reed selling out? Why, don't you see it? Phil returned savagely. He's the supreme representative of the highest and high-browed culture, ain't he? He's a Lord High Admiral Duke or Pontificate of some sort in the world of loftiness thought, isn't he? He lives and moves and has his being in the lofty realms of pure spirituality, don't he? He's cultured and cultivated and spiritualized until he vibrates nothing but pure soul, whatever that means. And he's refined himself and mentally disciplined himself and soul dominated himself until there's not an ounce of red blood left in his carcass. Get him betwixt you and the sun after what he calls a dinner and you can see every material mouthful that he has disgraced himself by swallowing. He's not human, I tell you. He's only a kind of a he-ghost and ought to be fed on sterilized moonbeams and pasteurized sunlight. Amen, said Patches solemnly when Phil paused from lack of breath. But Phil, your eloquent description of his character does not explain how the he-ghost has to do with the sale of the pothook house outfit. Phil's voice again dropped into a hopeless key as he answered. You remember how, from the very first, Kitty well sort of worshipped him, don't you? You mean how he worshipped his aesthetics cult, don't you? Corrected Patch as quietly. I suppose that's it, responded Phil gloomily. Well, Uncle Will says that they've been together mighty near every day for the past three months. 
Not about half the time they've been over at Kitty's home. He's discovered, he says, that Kitty possesses a rare and wonderful capacity for absorbing the higher truths of more purely intellectual and spiritual planes of life, and that she has a marvelously developed appreciation of those ideas of life which are so far removed from the base and material interests and passions which belong to mere animal existence of a common herd. Oh, hell, groaned Patches. Well, that's what he told Uncle Will, returned Phil. And he was harping on that string so long and yammering so much to Jim and Kitty's mother about the girl's wonderful smartness and what a record-breaking career she would have if only she had the opportunity and what a shame and a loss it is to her, to the world to have here being remained and buried in the soul-dwarfing surroundings that they got to believe in it themselves. You see, Kitty herself has in a way of getting used to them ideas that Williamson Valley isn't much of a place and that the cow business don't rank very high amongst the best of people. So Jim is going to sell out and move away somewhere where Kitty can have her career and the boys can grow up to be something better than low-down cow punchers like you and me. Jim, he's able to retire anyway. Thanks, Phil, said Patches quietly. What for? For including me in your class. I consider it a compliment, he said, and then he added with a touch of his old mocking humor. I think I know what I'm saying better, perhaps, than the he-ghost knows what he's talking about. It may be that you do, returned Phil wearily, but you can see where it puts me. The professor has sure got me down and hog tied so tight I can't think. Perhaps, and again, perhaps not, returned Patches. Reed ain't found a buyer for the outfit yet, has he? Not yet, but they'll come along fast enough. The Pothook S Ranch is too well known for the sale to hang fire for long. The next day, Phil seemed to slip back again into his attitudes toward Patches, to the temper of those last weeks of the rodeo. It was though the young man, with his return to the home ranch and the dean and their talks and plans of the work, again put himself, his personal convictions and particular regard for Patches aside, and became the unprejudiced foreman, careful of his employer's interests. Patches, very quickly, but without offense, found that the door which his friend had opened in the long dark hours on that lonely dark ride had closed again, and thinking that he understood, he made no attempt to force his way. But for some reason, Patches appeared to be an unusual happy frame of mind, went singing and whistling about the corrals and buildings, as though exceedingly well pleased with himself and the world. The following day was Sunday. In the afternoon, Patches was roaming about the premises, keeping at a safe distance from the walnut trees in front of the house, which the professor had cornered the dean, thus punishing both Patches and his employer by preventing one of their long Sunday talks which they both come to enjoy. Phil had gone off somewhere to be alone, and Miss Baldwin was reading aloud to little Billy. Honorable Patches was left very much to himself. From the top of the little hill near the corral, he looked across the meadow at exactly the right moment to see someone riding away from the neighborhood ranch. He watched until he was certain that whoever it was was not coming to the cross triangle, at least, not by way of the meadow lane. Then, smiling to himself, he went to the big barn and saddled a horse. There were always two or three that were not always turned out to pasture, and in a few minutes was riding leisurely away on the Simmons Road along the western edge of the valley. An hour later, he met Kitty Reed, who was on her way from Simmons to the Cross Triangle. The young woman was sincerely glad to meet him. But you were going to Simmons, were you not? she asked as he reined his horse about to ride with her. Well, to be truthful, I was going to Simmons if I met anyone else, or if I had not met you, he answered. 
and then at her puzzled look he explained. I saw someone leaving your house and guessed it was you. And I guessed too that you'd be coming this way. And you rode out to meet me? Yep, he smiled. They chatted about the rodeo and the news of the countryside, for it had been several weeks since they had met, and so reached the point of the last ridge before he come to the ranch. Then Patches asked, Might we ride over to that ridge and sit for a while in the shade of the old cedar for a wee talk? It's early yet, and it's been ages since we had us a little powwow. Reaching the point which Patches had chosen, they left their horses and made themselves comfortable on the brow of the hill, overlooking the wide valley meadow and the ranches. And now, said Kitty, looking at him curiously, what's all the talk about, Mr. Honorable Patches? Just you, said Patches gravely. Me? Your own charming self, he returned. But please, good sir, what have I done? she asked. Or perhaps what have I not done? Or, perhaps, it's what you're going to do. Oh. Miss Reed, I'm going to ask you a favor. A great favor. Yes. You've known me for almost a year. Yes. And yet, to be exact, you don't know me at all. She did not answer, but he looked at her steadily. And that, in a way, he continued, makes it easy for me to ask the favor. That is, if you feel that you can trust me ever so little, trust me, I mean, to the extent of believing me sincere. I know that you're sincere, Patches, she answered gravely. Thank you, he returned. Then he added gently, I want you to let me talk to you about what is most emphatically not in my business. I want you to let me ask you questions. I want you to talk to me about he hesitated and then finished with meaning. About your career. She felt his earnestness and was big enough to understand and be grateful for the spirit that prompted his words. Why, Patches, she cried. After all that your friendship has meant to me these past months, I could not think any question that you would ask is impertinent. Surely you know that, don't you? I hoped that you would feel that way, and I know that I'd give five years of my life if I knew how to convince you of the truth which I have learned from my own bitter experience, and save you from yourself. She could not mistake his earnestness, and in spite of herself the man's intense feeling moved her deeply. Save me from myself? What in the world do you mean, Patches? Is it true that your father is offering the ranch for sale and that you're going out of the Williamson Valley life? Yes, but it's not such a sudden move as it seems. We've often talked about it at home, mother and father and I. But the move is to be made chiefly on your account, is it not? She flushed a little at this, but answered stoutly. Yes, I suppose that is true. You see, being the only one in our family to have the advantage of, well, the advantage that I have had, it was natural that I should. Surely you've seen, Patches, how discontent and dissatisfied I've been with life here. Why, until you came here, there was no one to whom I could speak. Not even one. I mean, who could understand. But what is it you want, or expect to find that you might not find right here? Then she told him all that he'd expected to hear. Told him earnestly and passionately of the life she craved, of the sordid and commonplace narrowness and emptiness, as she saw it, of the life of which she sought to escape. And as she talked, the man's good heart was heavy with sadness and pity for her. Oh, girl, girl, he cried when she was finished. Can't you or won't you understand? All that you seek is right here, everywhere about you, waiting for you to make it your own. And with it, you may have here these greater things without which no life can abundantly be or as joyous. The culture, the intellectual life that is dependent upon mere environment, it's a crippling culture and sickly life. The mind that 
cannot find its food for thought wherever it may be placed will never hobble very far on crutches or on superficial cults or societies. You're leaving the substance, child, for a shadow. You're seeking the fads and fancies of shallow idlers and tearing your back upon eternal facts. You're following after silly fools who are chasing bubbles over the edge of God's good world. Believe me, girl, I know. But I know what that life stripped of its tinseled and spangled life shows means. Take the good grain, child, and let the husks go. As the man spoke, Kitty watched him as though she were intently interested. But in truth, her thoughts were more on the speaker than on what he said. You're in earnest, aren't you, Patches? She muttered softly. I am, he returned sharply, for he saw that she was not even considering what he said. I know how mistaken you are. I know what it will mean to you when you find how much you've lost and how little you've gained. But how am I mistaken? I do not know what I want. Am I not better able than anybody to say what satisfies me and what doesn't? No, he retorted almost harshly. You are not. You think it's culture, as you call it, that you want, but that it was really it. You would not go. You'd find it here, the greatest minds that the world has ever known. You may have right here in your home, on your library table. And you may listen to their thoughts without being disturbed by the magpie chatterings of vain and shallow pretenders. You're attracted by the pretentious forms and manners of that life. You think that because a certain class of people who have nothing else to do and talk a certain jargon and profess to follow certain teachers who nine times out of ten are charlatans or fools, that they're the intellectual and spiritual leaders of the race. You're mistaking the very things that prevent intellectual and spiritual development for the things you think you want. She did not answer his thought, but replied to his words. And supposing I am mistaken, as you say, still, I do not see why it should matter so to you. He made a gesture of hopelessness and sat for a moment in silence, and then he said, I fear you will not understand, but did you ever hear the story of how Wild Horse Phil earned his title? She answered and laughed. Why, of course. Everybody knows about that. Dear foolish old Phil, I'll miss him dreadfully. Yes, he said significantly. You will miss him. The life you're going to does not produce Phil Actons. It produced an honorable patches, she retorted slyly. Indeed it did not, he answered quickly. It produced... He checked himself, as though fearing that he would say too much. But what have Phil and his wild horse to do with the question? Nothing, I fear... Only I feel about your going away as Phil felt when he gave that wild horse its freedom. I, I don't think I understand, she said, genuinely puzzled. I said you wouldn't, he retorted bluntly, and that's why you're leaving all this. He gestured to indicate the vast sweep of country with old Granite Mountain in the distance. And then with a nod and a look he indicated Professor Parkool, who was walking towards them, along the side of the ridge skirting the scattering timbers. Here comes a product of that culture to which you aspire. Behold the ideal manhood of your higher life. When the intellectual and spiritual life you so desire succeeds in producing racial fruit of that superior quality, it will have justified its existence and will perish from the earth. <laughs>